Welcome, Massimo and Sky. Hi. Hello there. Uh, and welcome to the uh, Sophia audience. Um, I'm Daniel Kaufman, your disembodied host. Um, th- we're going to do something a little uh, different today. Uh, we're going to have uh, Massimo speaking with uh, Sky Cleary. Uh, Massimo requires no introduction, but we will give him one anyway. He is the K.D. Irani Professor of Philosophy at the City College uh, in the City University of New York. And his book, How to Be a Stoic, will soon be coming out, will be available on May 9th from Basic Books. Uh, I am happy also very much to introduce uh, Sky Cleary. Uh, her recent book from 2015, Existentialism and Romantic Love, came out on Macmillan Press. And I understand you just said that it just came out in paperback? Yep, just last week. So if you like uh, Sartre and love and sex, you should buy this. Um, <laughs> or any of those three. Uh, um, uh, Scott, you have a very interesting background. You have both a PhD and an MBA. Yep. What's that all about? Was that sort of regret or, or, or uh, <laughs> poverty or, or did it go in the other order or what? Um, no, well, the MBA came first. Um, so my background's in finance and management consulting, and I worked for a hedge fund for a few years. Um, and so it then, was regret, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then I became enlightened. Yeah. <laughs> no. um, and during my MBA, um, I studied um, some um, philosophy. You know, they had courses where I did my MBA in Australia called like existentialism and entrepreneurship, and foundations of management thought, which is very much a philosophy subject and managerial psychology. So I kind of uh, got hooked on philosophy uh, then um, and, you know, got into management consulting after my MBA, but then just uh, just kept being plagued by these questions. Um, and uh, one of my professors encouraged me to do a PhD. And uh, so here I am. Yep, there he is. <laughs> um, uh, Sky teaches uh, both at Columbia and at the City University of New York. Um, and um, she's the managing editor for the American Philosophical Association blog. And interestingly enough, she also served in the Australian Army Reserves, which I, I probably would love to talk to you about a whole other dialogue, um, and has a black belt in Taekwondo, which is interesting, partly, um, A, it's just interesting, but B, apparently Massimo also has taken up the fighting arts. <laughs> Massimo, you're kickboxing now, and you said you did judo and kung fu, so... Uh, right. Can we have like a match later, or uh... we should we we should have a conversation <laughs> about philosophy and the martial arts. That's that's a whole different. That would be interesting. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, today, however, we're going to do something less martial. Um, Massimo, as everyone knows, is, is has been not just uh, interested in in Stoic philosophy, but has been exploring Stoicism as a way of life, which is what it was, of course, for the ancient Greeks. And there now is a pretty substantial uh, community of people who are adopting the Stoic philosophy as a way of life. Um, and Sky is interested in existentialism, um, not just as a philosophy, but also uh, as a way of life. Um, and so we thought it would be, or Massimo had thought it would be a good idea for maybe the two of them to talk about the ways in which Stoicism and existentialism both as philosophies and as ways of life might be interestingly similar or different. So Massimo, did you want to start start out since this whole thing was your brainchild to begin with? Sure. Uh, so I, would, I, I thought that uh, Sky and I could just begin by presenting a very uh, short sort of capsule version of the two philosophies. I'll start with stories and then Sky can do it's essential. And then we'll just uh, explore both the similarities, which I think actually there is, there is a surprising number. Uh, and some of the differences, because after all, <laughs> there, there are some significant differences there as well. And, uh, and then, uh, let basically our listeners, uh, you know, sort of judge, oh, well, that resonates with me, or that doesn't resonate with me. So I, I'll, I'll get, get us started with Stoicism. So, uh, Stoicism has a couple of fundamental ideas. One is that, um, uh, the meaning of a, a meaningful life, a life worth living, is a life of practicing virtue. Uh, and this is virtue in the ancient Greek-Roman sense of the term. There are four fundamental virtues. These are practical wisdom, which is the ability to navigate uh, complex situations in the best possible way. Uh, courage, 
which is not just physical courage. Uh, it doesn't have to do only with Taekwondo or, or, or uh, kickboxing, but it has to do with moral courage, the, the courage to stand up to, for, for situations and for people. Um, then temperance, the ability to uh, exercise self-control, not, not to go into excesses of, of, of sorts. Uh, and then finally, justice, uh, which is understood as uh, treating other people with fairness, the way in which you would like uh, to be treated. So, so for the Stoic, if you practice sincerely the four virtues, that in and of itself is both necessary and sufficient to make your life worth living. Now, the word that is often used is happy, uh, which of course is a bad translation of the Greek term eudaimonia. Obviously, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty obvious that no, you wouldn't necessarily be happy because you could be very virtuous, but also poor and sick and, and so on and so forth. So you wouldn't be happy in the normal sense of the term, but your life would be worth living according to the Stoics. And in fact, your life would be even more worth living uh, than the life of, let's say, a very healthy and very wealthy person who, however, does wicked things, who doesn't practice virtue, who takes advantage of other people, and so on and so forth. So that's one of the fundamental tenets of Stoicism. The other one um, is the so-called dichotomy of control. Uh, this was best articulated by Epictetus, uh, one of the late Roman Stoics, but it's present from the beginning of the philosophy, from uh, all the way back to Zeno of Citium, uh, who was the founder of the philosophy in, in about 300 BCE. And the dichotomy of control basically says that wisdom and, and sort of uh, a, a, a serene life come out of understanding and internalizing that certain things are under your control and other things are not under your control, and that you should focus on where your your, your agency can actually be effective, that is, under things that are under your control. Uh, so all external happenings are not under your control. Uh, you can influence them. You know, some of them are obviously not under your control, like the weather. You know, there's nothing I can do about the weather. Uh, but other things like, you know, to succeed in my job, for instance, in my profession, that's technically not under my control, according to the Stoics, because it's not entirely under my control. I can, I can influence it. I can work hard. I can you know, build a good resume or whatever it is, but I may still not get the job or I may still not get a promotion or something like that. The things that are under my control are essentially my values, my decisions, and my behaviors, my, my judgments about, about things. Uh, so what that means is that uh, a stoic tries to go through life by internalizing his or her goals. So my goal is not going to be to uh, get a promotion uh, because that's outside of my control, but it's rather going to be to do the best job that I can in order to put my forth, uh, uh, you know, myself forth in the best possible way uh, to be competitive for a promotion. Whether I get it or not is not up to me, but I, I am happy because I've done the best that I could. Or in the case of a relationship, you know, my goal cannot be to be loved by my partner. My goal has to be to be a lovable person. Because that's the thing that is really under my control. Whether it turns out that, in fact, that particular other person is going to love me or not, uh, that is not up to me, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot more, of, obviously, to it, and, maybe, and probably some of it will come out uh, during the discussion. But I think that the focus on virtue and the internalization and the dichotomy of control are really the defining points of stoicism. Scott, can I do something maybe similar to substantialism? Sure. Um, so, it's existentialism is a lot less uh, systematic than that, and it's much harder to define because uh, it's not an official school, like more like Stoicism is. Um, but it's more of a descriptive term for a group of philosophers who talked about similar themes of freedom, choice, responsibility, anxiety, and authenticity. Um, so they were reacting to the Enlightenment when everything was about objectivity and scientific facts. And they said, well, what about the passionate, subjective experience? What about, like, concrete living? Um, and rather than just abstract armchair theorizing. Um, so existentialism became particularly popular during, like, World War II because it acknowledged that human existence is horrifying and it's absurd. And they emphasized personal race. So some of the key themes are that um, we're thrown into the 
you know, we don't choose how or where we arrive, but once we're here, we need to choose how to live. Um, also, one of the most famous maxims of existentialism is that existence precedes essence. So we exist first, and then we're free to define who we are through the choices we make. Um, so we're nothing to begin with, but we are what we make of ourselves. Um, so for the existentialists, every action is a choice. Um, we always have choices, and as Sartre says, there's no exit from our freedom, and we're condemned to be free. Um, and so for the existentials, we're responsible for who we are. Um, however, Simone de Beauvoir, for example, also um, emphasized that um, situations put limitations on our freedom. For example, um, uh, poverty, ignorance, and oppression limit the kinds of choices that we can make. Um, so we have a responsibility to choose our lives, but also to strive for authenticity, which is about choosing what we think is genuine and right for ourselves. Um, it means that, yes, yeah, certainly we can admit external influences, that as long as we know that, recognize that it's our choice and our responsibility in the end. Um, and we can deny that we have choices, um, but that's what um, the existentialists would have called bad faith. Um, and so, but also the existentialist suggested that it can be really scary to um, realize that we can't blame um, everything on biology or circumstance. Um, and so that's why uh, the existentialists say that we were plagued with anxiety. Um, and so one of the key questions is that um, if we're free, is, as Dostoevsky put it, um, if God is dead, is everything permitted? Well, the existentialists would say no, um, but that's where existentialism starts. You know, there's nothing to depend on. We, we arrive in the world. We don't have a guidebook. Um, life is ours to make sense of, and it's up to us to choose um, its value. Um, but it's, and existentialism is often portrayed as a very individualistic philosophy, but they also acknowledge that we are born into webs of relationships. Um, if we value freedom for ourselves, then we value it for other people too. Um, and they acknowledge that when we make a choice, we're affirming that it's a valuable thing to do. So, and we think it would be good if everyone did as we did. Um, so if you marry, you're affirming the value of marriage or the value of the institution of marriage. Um, and through our choices, we create the kind of world that we want to live in. All right. Great. So uh, what I was thinking of doing, you know, I had some notes here about possible uh, topics for discussion. Maybe I divided them for my own um, sort of uh, usage in sort of potential differences and potential similarities. Maybe we can just start and alternate the two. So we don't want to go through all the differences first and all the similarities. Also, because we may not have actually time to cover everything. But so, for instance, let's starting with the differences. So, in fact, as you just said, existentialism is often defined as an approach that rejects systematic philosophies, uh, while stoicism is, is probably the paramount example of a systematic philosophy. So maybe we can talk a little bit about, about that. So what does it mean to be or not to be a systematic philosophy? Because when you started describing uh, existentialism, you said, well, there are certain things that are firm uh, about, and you know, if you, if you don't accept a certain number of notions or a certain uh, crucial concept, then you really shouldn't call yourself uh, existentialist. And I know that there is some, some disagreement on who is an existentialist and who is not. But nonetheless, it seems to me that perhaps it's not a complete, you know, coherent logical system, but it is nonetheless, I mean, when, when, when you do have a philosophy of some sort, it seems to me that you sort of automatically you have a system, in a sense. Or, 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 or is that something, there's a different way of looking at it? Yeah, I think why they're not um, considered to be systematic is, yes, sure, sure, there are some certain principles underlying, you know, the foundation of existential philosophies, but there are so many different, um, well, every different philosopher had a different philosophy, and also they changed their ideas on philosophy throughout their lives. For example, we could probably only call Sartre an existentialist um, in being a nothingness and in his early writings, because then later he kind of explored Marxism. Um, so, okay, well, first of all, you, um, you should be aware, or wary of anyone who calls themselves an existentialist because <laughs> like that's, that's anti-existential because it means we're being defined by a role or categorized and existential philosophy says, well, no, we can't be reduced to one thing. 
Um, and so it reminds me of um, the film The Life of Brian, where Brian's yes. up in front of the crowd and saying, you're all individuals, and yes, which is very existential. And um, the one person in the crowd says, I'm not, which is ironic because he is the only individual. Um, and then Brian says, you've all got to work it out for yourselves. Um, and the crowd says, yes, we've all got to work it out for ourselves. <laughs> and so, you know, they, they like, tell us more, which is like they're not right. working it out for themselves at all. Um, so, yeah, although there are these – so. The, the, there are the basic principles, but how people live those. I mean, the existential philosophers lived it differently um, and had different ideas about how we should live. Um, but, I mean, they're all dealing with the same um, question, which is, well, how should we live? And not just how should we live, but what should we do? And they're very excited about um, dealing with concrete problems of existence and everyday living, which is why, you know, existential philosophy is also inspired, um, you know, existential psychoanalysis, um, which is still, um, you know, a, a, a quite a big school. Um, and, but it is about everyday living. And there's a story, have you heard the story that um, existentialism was started over an apricot cocktail? Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, Sartre and um, uh, Simone de Beauvoir were at a cafe with their friend Raymond Aron, and um, Aron had just been studying um, phenomenology, and he came back and said to Sartre and Beauvoir, you know, if you were a phenomenologist, you could make a philosophy out of this apricot cocktail. And Jean-Paul Sartre was so excited, and he said, oh, he, he said to himself at the time, oh, finally, there is philosophy, because he could philosophize about concrete, everyday things. Okay, I pref I do prefer martinis uh, over over Africa cup, but, but you know it's that's, that's a question <laughs> of uh, taste. Okay, so what you were saying uh, uh, brought to my mind a couple of things. I, I think we should talk about the psychotherapy actually later, uh, um, hopefully because there too there are some interesting similarities and differences with with stoicism. But uh, you talk about roles, right? So you're not we're, we're not defined by by our roles. So, so which means that even calling yourself an existentialist is like it's a it's a weird thing. <laughs> Uh, now, Stoics too, typically also don't call themselves Stoics, but that's not because they don't they don't like the label in general, because they think it's pretentious, and so they they uh, refer to themselves as prokoptontes, which in Greek means somebody who is hopefully making progress, <laughs> right? So it's a student basically. Uh, but the thing about roles is interesting. So there is a, um, an entire book that came out recently uh, about Epictetus, uh, and it's called Epictetus' uh, Role Ethics, because Epictetus actually does insist that we do have roles, and we are defined by our roles in an important sense. Uh, but we don't have just one role, and some of these roles we, we choose, and others are sort of Part of, I think, what if my if my understanding is, is correct, are part of what an existentialist would call a facticity. That is, they just come with. You know, you, you're born in a certain place in a certain time, and so on and so forth. So there are certain things that are part of your background, and then you don't choose. Uh, you can decide what to do about them or you know, how to use them, but but you're not, you, you know, you're not, you don't have a complete freedom of of uh, uh, about the facts of, and the circumstances of your existence. So. For, for Epictetus, we all have different roles, but it's not, we're not defined by one role. We are actually, uh, simultaneously different things, right? So I am a father. I can be a companion. I can be a teacher. I can be a friend. I can be all sorts of things. Um, and for Epictetus, what's important is how you play that role. Uh, that is, uh, now of course he doesn't use the word authenticity there, but I guess there is a similarity because he says, you know, you can play your role as, uh, badly and sort of be being a bad actor essentially uh you know is he, he sees he really does see life as a stage uh all on on which we play different 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 parts and the part that we play is not necessarily up to us or certainly not in all the details and all the aspects of that part but how we play it it is and so if i'm a father i can be a good father or a bad father if i'm a uh, teacher, I can be a good teacher, or a bad teacher, and so on and so forth. And of course, what makes a difference between a good and a bad uh, interpretation of that role is whether you follow the virtues or not, whether you're trying to be a virtuous father or teacher, and so on and so forth. I don't see that necessarily as dramatically incompatible with an existential uh, uh, view of things. Do you? Yeah, no, that sounds, um, there are some similarities there. I think the existentialist would probably say that um, actually choosing that role and um, what roles we play are up to us. Like they're not imposed on us from the outside, but it's up to us to choose whether we 
become um, a father or a, or what role we play in society. Um, so I'm not sure if the roles we play would be inc- necessarily included in the facts or facticity or facts of our existence. Right. Um, but uh, and I think Sasha gives the example of a waiter in Being in Nothingness who's playing right. the role um, perfectly um, but fails to realize that there is a part of it, like his being cannot be reduced to just a waiter because we're, we're always um, part of a project or we're always transcending and launching ourselves into the future and we always have multiple projects and so just we can't be just defined by one thing or even, I mean, if you've a, a waiter and a father. I mean, we can't just reduce our being to be s- described by that. But I'm not sure. I mean, that doesn't mean to say that we can't take on, actively choose and take on um, different roles in life. But as long as we know that we're, it's our choice and, right. uh, you know, as well as our choice how to live them. Right, right. No, yeah. So I think there's similarity. I mean, Epictetus, of course, would say that some of the roles are Cho- uh, chosen, um, you know, you decide what career to do, you decide whether to become a father or a mother or something like that. Other ones are not. Of course, you remember that in, in his case, he was a slave, he started out his life as a slave, and that certainly wasn't his choice, uh, right? That was something that was imposed on him and that he did not, uh, have, uh, it was not in his power to change until much later on when he was freed and then, he, you know, and then he chose to become a, a teacher. Uh, but yeah, it doesn't seem to me, to me, to me to be fundamentally incompatible. Now, here's on the, on, Something that I put under the column of similarities is a um, uh, quote f- by Kierkegaard who said that uh, a person's unhappiness never lies in his lack of control over external conditions since this would only make him completely unhappy, unquote. Now, that does sound to me actually remarkably stoic because, as I said uh, earlier, the dichotomy of control says that you shouldn't be putting your happiness or, you know, the meaning of your meaningfulness of your life into external circumstances because external circumstances can change on a dime. Uh, that doesn't mean that they're not important. I mean, often Stoics are uh, sort of caricatured as saying, oh, that they, they don't care about, you know, education, health, wealth, and so on and so forth. Of course they do. Um, but, but they realize that you could be a wealthy person one day and then lose it all the following day, or that you can be very healthy one day and then get sick, uh, you know, the following day and so on and so forth. And so that if your happiness is tied to the external circumstances, that you're bound to be unhappy, essentially. That, now, I, I don't, I'm not too familiar with the context in which that quote by Kierkegaard would actually fit in the general existentialism, uh, sort of, uh, idea. And also Kierkegaard, of course, is a very, very early existentialist, right? I mean, he, de- he certainly didn't use the term. But what, does that strike you as something that, Modern existentialists would accept that the, the thing that I said from uh, I quoted from Kierkegaard. Yeah, and I think Sartre would also agree with that. Um, yeah, because Kierkegaard was kind of retrospectively labeled um, an existentialist. But um, yeah, so they because um, uh, Sartre it reminds me of what Sartre said: is you're never so free as when you're in chains, and what matters is how you view the situation. Which and I also found a quote from Epictetus: "A podium in a prison is each a place." one high and the other low, but in either place your freedom of choice can be maintained if you so wish. Right? Right. So it's very much this re beating maxim not to get upset by the things around us, but by the views we take of them. So the goal is to kind of own our thoughts or um, control you know, how we view things. Um, and Sartre talks in specifically about like a, a rocky crag or a rocky mountain um, that's blocking our path. And he says, well, it's only an obstacle if we see it as an obstacle. Um, and if we cho- we take that into account, into our facticity, and we change our path and, and choose not to view it as an obstacle, then it's no longer a problem. Um, <laughs> so now Simone de Beauvoir, on the other hand, would have disag- like she did disagree with that. And she says, yeah, well, we have the freedom to think as we choose, but if we come across a craggy mountain or a locked door, um, I mean, banging against the locked door is certainly um, completely useless, but just um, changing our view of that situation isn't necessarily the answer either. And her point was that if you can't act on your freedom, then it's meaningless. It's a pyrrhic victory. So her philosophy was very much about action. Um, and she and um, Sartre used to argue about this and she would get seasickness and Sartre told her it was all in her head and she just had to change her thinking about it. And she's, <laughs> and she's like, no, I don't think so. She should have thrown up on him. That would have... Uh, that well, <laughs> Actually, there, there's, a, there's a story, a stoic story about seasickness, which is kind of interesting uh, because it's sort of, 
I think it actually strikes a compromise between those two positions, the, the Sartre and the Bobbio position, because um, so there's this story about a, a, a Stoic philosopher who embarks on this on this voyage, and and then there is a, a, a storm, and the storm is very frightening, and he gets seasick, and in fact he gets also scared by the whole thing, right? Uh, and then the, then the storm is over, and uh, he recovers his composure, and he goes about. The, the ship uh, as if nothing happened and the captain makes fun of him he says oh so you're the stoic philosopher you're supposed not to care about external circumstances but I saw you you were sick and you were you know afraid during the storm and uh, the stoic responds yes but I am not now that is under that how to think about the experience is up to me of course I'm I'm scared when something happens that is scary that's a human thing to do I have no control over seasickness or I have no control over you know being scared what I do have control over is how I react and how I think about it. Do, do you see me dwelling on the experience now? No, it's done and it's in the past. It's no longer under my control. And so I move on. So there is actually a, a way to sort of balance those two things, meaning that uh, it's certainly the case that if the door is closed and you want to get in, well, you're not going to get in unless you find a way to force the door, right? Um, but it is also the case that sometimes in life we find closed doors and instead of keep banging on it and waste a lot of energy and time over, you know, obsessing over the door, perhaps we turn around another corner and there is another door or there is a window or there is another street and another place to go some, somewhere uh, equally interesting. You know, that, that seems to be. Um. Now, you, you, you mentioned a couple of times already psychotherapy, so I think we should get there because you mentioned IBT, which for our listeners is uh, Rational Emotive Behavioral Therapy. And, um, and then Viktor Frankl often, often comes up in discussions of both stoicism and existentialism. Frankl was uh, the survival, uh, he was a survivor of the Holocaust, and uh, he wrote very influential books in the 1950s and 60s, and he established something called logotherapy, which is a type of uh, rational emotive behavioral therapy, although the two are actually distinct. Um, now, the thing that strikes me as interesting is that both the Stoics and the existentialists claim uh, Frankl, uh, uh, I've read existentialist authors who say that, that logotherapy is a type of existentialist therapy, uh, but I also know that Stoics consider uh, Viktor Frankl one of the founders of modern, uh, sort of, uh, uh, the modern cognitive behavioral therapy that is informed very much by Stoic techniques and the Stoic take on things. Um, so he seems to be kind of an overlap between the two philosophies. But outside of that, you have, my understanding is that, uh, Existentialist psych psychotherapy is very much into the Freudian and Jungian sort of uh, tradition of doing psychotherapy, while on the other hand, the Stoic one is definitely very much in the tradition of uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is very different. It completely rejects the Freudian approach. So I wonder what do you think about of the relationship in general between sort of philosophy and psychotherapy, I suppose, and also specifically about you know existentialism and, and Viktor Frankl. Um, so. So in existential um, psychotherapy, I mean, especially the one that um, Sartre talked about in Being in Nothingness, the emphasis is on consciousness raising to um, understand what, or to become aware of what choices we have and become aware of, you know, how we can be free. So it's overcoming the limitations of ignorance on um, and understanding the different options that we have. Um, so the emphasis on creating choices and freedom and coming to terms with um, things like anxiety and death and a lot of these issues that existential philosophy raises. Um, so, and in terms of... Um, my view on whether that's a, a good idea or not. Um, so I guess I, I'm torn between, I, I'm not an existential psychotherapist and I haven't done um, any training there, but um, I guess my question is that if we um, raise our consciousness to be aware of anxiety and death and things like that, then that might not make us feel any better. <laughs> um, and, you know, coming to terms with the existential absurdity of life, I mean, it can help in some cases, and I acknowledge that, but it, it might not help in all cases. Um, so that's my hesitation with, um, you know, applying this to therapy. Right. What, what about, but wait, wait one second, what about Massimo's question about the fact that, the, the, regarding the fact that existentialism seems to have at least two psychotherapeutic tracks that it's pursued. One, 
that's more along the lines of this logical, uh, uh, rational, what, what did you call it? Or behave, rational? Rational emotive behavior, yeah. behavior therapy. Yeah. And then on the other hand, it's very well known in historical connection with psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I mean, it is very much like what I was talking about with, you know, the Rocky Crag, that it was, um, you know, very Sartrean philosophy is very similar to that REBT principle of um, not being upset by the things around us, but by the views we take of them. Um, and, you know, I think there's a lot of value in doing um, if, if existential psychotherapy is, um, you know, I think that's a valid option. But what about its relationship to depth psychology, which is a so, total... To depth psychology, to, to psychoanalysis, which is a totally different tradition. Um, I mean, there's actually something called existential psychoanalysis. Um, is that just not a tradition you're familiar with? Yeah, no, I haven't done any study in that area. Yeah, so that strikes me as, as interesting, however, that uh, the distinction between sort of philosophy and psychotherapy, right? I mean, or therapy in general, so, so therapy in general. So obviously, philosophies are not therapies, uh, although they may have therapeutic. Uh, so sort of components or effects, and vice versa, therapies are not philosophies, although they may be based or, or inspired by a philosophy. So one, one of the things that happened last year at the Stoicon conference, which is the, this gathering, as you were there, uh, Sky, uh, a, as an existentialist lurking in the middle of Stoics. And uh, one of the things that we had was a presentation on um, Raja Emotive Behavioral Therapy, and its connections with uh, Stoicism. And the, the connection is usually that um, a philosophy is supposed to give you this sort of overall framework for how to think about stuff, right? And that framework, in the case of a practical philosophy especially, like I consider both Stoicism and, and, and existentialism uh, practical philosophies, uh, that is the kind of thing that is, is supposed to basically give you general guidance about, you know, priorities in life, how to think about your life, where, how to make your decisions, you know, in, in, a, in a sensible way, in a way that actually reflects your values, your choices, and so on and so forth. A therapy, on the other hand, is much more specific. It's like, oh, I got fear of death. How do I deal with that? Right? I, I, I wake up in, you know, this sweating terror uh, at, the, at the idea of dying. You know, how do I deal, uh, deal with that? And you're right, of course, um, the efficacy of psychotherapy, of set therapies in general, it varies. I mean, the, uh, I'm more familiar with the CBT variety, which, which actually has a significant amount of sort of evidence-based, uh, uh, you know, support. But even so, you know, the efficacy is certainly not 100%. I mean, some people get over their anxieties and some people don't get over their anxieties. And, uh, 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 but I wouldn't consider that a failure of the philosophy necessarily. I would say, yeah, well, the philosophy still gives you the general framework and it sounds uh, reasonable or coherent or whatever it is. Whether that's going to help you in this specific case or not, uh, that depends on a number of circumstances, right? Mm-hmm. Now, the other, uh, another uh, uh, sort of difference there, I think, uh, comes to uh, the treatment that the two philosophies give to the question of suicide. So uh, Camus, who I understand actually rejected the label of existentialist, um, especially after a certain period, after he, he, he had a falling out with Sartre. But he said, and I quote, there is only one truly serious philosophical problem, and that is suicide. So I, I'd like to hear a little bit about what, what he meant by that. And, and if, if that's a serious philosophical problem, do, do we have an existentialist answer to that problem? Because the Stoics do have an answer, and, and we'll, I'll get to that after, uh, uh, in, in, in a minute, uh, to that question. And I suspect it's going to be very different from the existentialist answer, but, but we'll see. Maybe I'm, sur- I'm going to be surprised. Mm-hmm. Um, yes, well, I think what's at the bottom of that is, um, that's from an existential view, is, well, why should we not kill ourselves? You know, why should we're, we're going to die anyway? Why should we not um, commit suicide now? What is there to live for, and what is the meaning of life? And so the, the existential question is: What meaning do we give and infuse into our life? Um, now, Simone de Beauvoir took a different approach, and she said, um, "You know, don't gamble on the future. Change your life today." And her view was that: Yes, we're going to die. We don't know when, so that means we need to make every day meaningful um, and live fully. Um, so. I think Camus is also famous. I'm not sure where he said this, but um, he's like, shall I kill myself or have a cup of coffee? He's like, I'll go have a cup of coffee. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And I think it's about appreciating what is 
um, beautiful in life and what we should live for. And, you know, at the bottom of existential, existential philosophy is it's, it's about embracing life and living passionately. What's Stop well, you. so that's, that strikes me as interesting because, um, again, there are actually some similarities there. So uh, there are two issues that are entangled. Uh, one is the issue of death, of our mortality, right? And the other one is the issue of meaning or, or lack of meaning, which may lead to desperation to sort of and suicide, right? So, um, so let me start with the suicide. So the Stoics' take on suicide is that it is ethically acceptable only under extreme circumstances. This is what Epictetus referred to as the um, the open door policy. The open door policy is, uh, uh, he uses these analogies, says, look, if the house gets really smoky, uh, there's a lot of smoke and there's fire and all that, and, and it's impossible to breathe, then uh, walk through the door. The door is open, you can get out. And of course, the, the house, the smoky house, is the is an, a, a metaphor for a really, really difficult life, a really hard life that it's hard to uh, actually cope with. And he says, well, if that's the case, uh, for whatever reason, uh, then you have the possibility. And you, you, the, your, your, uh, your freedom, as Seneca put it, is uh, constantly in your wrists. Right? You, can, you can slit them and then you're done. Um, but the converse of that is that Epictetus also says, if you stay, however, in the house, if you decide to stay, uh, then don't complain because it means that you actually found that there is enough meaning or there is enough uh, reason for you to stay because you, the door is open you can walk out every time if you decide to stay that means that actually you find enough uh, reasons to stay right and then you and then you should take responsibility for uh, for what it is that you're going to be doing for those reasons so that's um, that is the answer to the suicide question for the Stoics but the answer to the and that may be fairly different from the existentialist one on the other hand the answer to the question of you know mortality I think it's much, or what to make of the question of mortality is much more similar because the Stoic re- answer there, Seneca would agree. We don't, we, 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 we don't know when we're going to die. Uh, you know, the, Seneca says several times, uh, there is an entire essay he wrote on the shortness of life where he says, you know, people often say when somebody young dies, they say, oh, he's gone before his time. And they say, and he says, what does that mean? I mean, nobody, nobody knows what his time is. <laughs> Right, uh, the universe decided that that was the time, and who the hell are you to argue with the universe? Right, this 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 happened, and it is what it is. So to to say that things happen before their time or not makes no sense. But precisely because we are in a situation where we don't know when life is going to end, then Seneca, uh, and actually all the major Roman Stoics, including Marcus Aurelius, uh, said that explicitly. Then you need to take to take advantage of every moment. You should live every moment to the fullest. You should focus on the hic et nunc in Latin, the here and now, uh, precisely because you don't know how much longer you're going to have. And, it, you know, if you are engaging in activities that are uh, wasteful of your time and energy and resources, if you're doing things you don't want to do, if you're doing things just because it's, uh, you know, proper the proper thing to do from a social perspective or some societal perspective or something like that you're just wasting precious energy that could be the last day of your life and the question is you know how do you want to spend it in a faculty meeting probably not right <laughs> um, so in that sense i think there is actually a significant amount of similarity uh be- between the two um uh, okay so my next um point was about uh gabriel marcel who uh, was apparently, uh, you know, I don't know much about him, but he was uh, uh, labeled as an existentialist at some point. And then, interestingly, he rejected the label of existentialist. Apparently, that's a normal thing to do for existentialists. It is. But in favor, and this is what stru- struck me as, as weird, in favor of the term neo-Socratic. And apparently that was in honor of Kierkegaard's essay on the concept of irony. Now, uh, I wouldn't... I don't. I wouldn't uh, label the existential. I wouldn't sort of uh, uh, assimilate the existentialist to to Socrates or to neo Socraticism. But do you think that there is something in there? I mean, what, what's the what is the existentialist take on sort of ancient philosophy, ancient Greek philosophy in general? Because if you're a neo Socratic, presumably mean it means that you have some uh, affinity for for whatever it is that Socrates. Uh, thought and taught or the way he lived. So maybe is it because Socrates had an authentic life in some sense? He was living an authentic life? 
Possibly. I'm not really familiar with Gabriel Marcel. Um, but I mean, certainly, I mean, what comes to mind is Nietzsche and he very much <laughs> admired, um, the, um, ancient Greek way of living. I think he said where, um, men were warriors and women were for their recreation. Misogynistic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, um, he, lo- what Nietzsche liked about the ancient Greek society was that, um, it was very structured and orderly and everyone knew what their roles were. Um, and, uh, Nietzsche was very critical of marrying for love. Um, and he's like, no, let's go back to the ancient Greek model, um, where, you know, you couldn't get divorced. Um, and <laughs> so because he sort of saw, um, romantic love is something that was, um, or sexual love is something frivolous and fleeting. And he's like, you can't base an institution on an idiosyncrasy like romantic love. So no, let's go back to like order and structure that the, um, <laughs> the ancient Greeks had. Um, sorry. They- yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, although he was famously, uh, not a fan of the Apollonian strand of, uh, I mean, I mean, uh, he was a, he was he was a fan of the Dionysian strain of of right. of, of Greek philosophy, and, and uh, uh, he certainly was not a fan of the Socratic rationalism. Um, um, although I guess the the Socratic authenticity might have appealed, right? I mean, the fact that Socrates rather drink would rather drink the poison than uh, escape from the prison, I guess, would have a certain existentialist appeal uh, if if you want to sort of think of it that way, um, but. Um, but I always thought that that he, his his aversion to the Apollonian side of the or his his belief that it was there was an, that the Apollonian side dominated too much and dominates too much our recollection of ancient Greek uh, thought um, would have made him not a fan of the Socratic <laughs> the Socratic side, which is certainly uh, certainly not, not a Stoic approach. Yeah, um, yeah, good, yeah. Sure. Yeah, I mean, th- yeah, yeah, I mean. Nietzsche was, um, I mean, yeah, he was, cri- he criticized, you know, this overemphasis or exalting the Apollonian and the rational at the expense of the passions. Because he said the passions are important too. We need both. It's like the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain. And we need to, um, balance reason and passion together. Yeah. So that, that actually brings me to, to talk about a little bit about the passion. So you wrote a book about love from an existentialist perspective. And maybe, maybe you can give us a sort of a little summary of it, of that in a, in a minute. But one of the things, as you know, that is often thought about stoicism, and I do think is actually a misunderstanding, is that stoicism is about suppressing the, the passions, suppressing the emotions. And in fact, I'm using those two terms, passions and emotions. Uh, for a specific reason, because the Stoics, well, well a lot of modern uh, talk confuses the two. That you know, we refer to as an emotional person as passionate and vice versa. But for the, the Stoics actually use those terms in a technical sense, and they distinguish between the passions and the emotions. And they, uh, they thought that the passions are destructive emotions. So things like fear and hatred and um, uh, anger, uh, especially. Those are destructive, and yes, those they do, they did, they did cancel to suppress, to control, to eliminate if possible. Uh, you know, uh, Seneca wrote an entire book on, on anger and, and which is the earliest manage, uh, you know, the earliest treaty on, on, on anger management that, that, that we have in the Western tradition. But they also thought of themselves, of their philosophy as a philosophy of love. Which is kind of surprising if, you know, Stoics is usually not, sort of, Stoicism is usually not a, uh, uh, associated with that word. But that's because they thought that love, uh, in the broadest possible sense, you know, the Greeks had a different, several different understandings of the word love, uh, unlike the modern English language. One of the things that I find frustrating about the modern English language is that, uh, you know, in English, it's you use the word love for everything. You know, I love my daughter. I love my companion. I love my friends. I love my pizza. It's like, you know, no, wait a minute. Those are very different things. You should be using different words for those. And the, and the Greeks did use different words. But the Stoics said that, um, that the, you should actually cultivate. The point is, in fact, to cultivate the positive emotions because you do want to develop in love in the broadest possible sense, including sort of a love for humanity itself. You know, they were among the first... Uh, to use the concept of cosmopolitanism, for instance, that you should you should really consider they they refer to each other as brothers and sisters. Uh, that 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 humanity at large is a brotherhood and sisterhood um, of uh, of people. But so, 
what about existentialism and love? So, so since you you wrote the book about it, may, maybe we should talk about that for a minute. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. Well, just to give a brief overview of my book, um, I argue that a lot of the frustrations and disappointments in romantic relationships come from misplaced expectations and unrealistic ideals um, about um, what we should do in relationships, um, what roles we should take on, what Hollywood is telling us, what our family is telling us, and this sort of thing. So. Um, and I argue that um, in order to uh, be free to create authentically meaningful relationships, we need to free ourselves from these um, uh, destructive expectations and ideals and also free ourselves from being slaves to our passions. And I actually think that's very consistent with the uh, Stoic view. Um, in fact, there's a Marcus Aurelius quote where he says, um, don't be pulled like a puppet by every impulse. Um, and uh, the existentialist would absolutely agree with that, um, especially Kierkegaard, who um, talked about um, the aesthetic sphere being like the lowest sphere of existence. And it's where it's a very childlike sphere. It's impulsive. Um, it's where we're slaves to our passions. Um, he talks about Mozart's Don Giovanni being like the ultimate representative of that sphere because yep. he's always <laughs> like just chasing the next woman. He's a slave to his lusty desires. Um, so Kierkegaard recommended leaping to a higher ethical sphere um, or rational sphere and then ultimately to another religious sphere. But, I mean, Kierkegaard, even though he advocated leaping to this higher rational sphere, he, he also said let's not forget like the beauty and um, the, you know, the amazing things that come along with the aesthetic sphere because um, being in love is wonderful and sex is great. Um, and uh, you know, there's an Epictetus quote where he says, freedom isn't secured by filling up on your heart's desire, but by removing your desire. So the existentialists were like, no, don't remove desires. No, the desires are a beautiful and important part of life. Um, so, but they should be balanced in concert with um, reason. Um, so, yes, free, let's free ourselves from being slaves to our passions, but not free ourselves from our passions entirely. Um, and, I mean, Nietzsche says um, how wise it is at times to be a little tipsy. So <laughs> having a little of both is um, really important. Oh, that, that actually reminds me. So that, that's an interesting quote that you pulled out from Epictetus, but it reminds me of a contrast between Epictetus and Seneca. So you're right. Epictetus says exactly that in fact on several, in several occasions. But, but uh, to be fair, Epictetus was also arguably the most cynic-like of the Stoics. You know, so the cynics were the extreme version of the Stoics. They were the, the, um, uh, the people that were living a minimalist life, you know, no property, no relations, no nothing. You know, it's like it's 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 all about virtue, and that's it. Uh, they were beggars, basically. They lived in the streets, um, and they were very colorful characters. But and Epictetus actually write an entire uh, chapter in the discourses in praise of cynicism, and, he, and essentially says, you know, uh, if you can't be a cynic, at least be a stoic. It's like you know, it's, it's, just, it's just your second choice. Seneca is a very different kind of character and actually he says something very much along the lines of what you just mentioned. Uh, there is a wonderful passage in Seneca where he says, look, sometimes you want to just go out and enjoy a, uh, the fresh air and um, you know, drink some wine and sometimes even drink a little too much wine because, you know, why, why not? Once in a while, this is what life offers and you need, you need to embrace it so long as the wine or the pleasure or something like that doesn't control you. So long as you own the pleasure and not the other way around. And of course, so long as you remember that uh, pleasure in life is a preferred indifferent, to use the stoic terminology, meaning that it's something that if you have it or you don't have it, uh, you know, if you, you prefer it, it's preferred, but it's indifferent, meaning that it makes no difference whatsoever to your ability to pursue virtue and that you will never trade it with virtue. You don't compromise your moral character in order to get pleasure, unlike Don Giovanni, who clearly, <laughs> who clearly does that uh, at every turn, and then he pays the, 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 pri the ultimate price for it at the end of the, of, of the opera, right? So in that sense, I think that, that sometimes, I think it's fair to say, right, that, that in existentialism, what counts as an existentialist precept or an existentialist idea does depend a lot on the individual philosopher. Right, that, that Kierkegaard is one thing, Nietzsche is another thing, Sartre is a third thing, the Bavir is another one, and so on and so forth. Um, I think the same can be said for Stoicism, but to a much lesser degree. That is, Stoics also did disagree on, in terms of emphasis and in terms of, you know, on a number of details. I mean, Posidonius is one of the 
lesser known Stoics because there's comparatively less uh, uh, of what he wrote that actually survived today. There's only fragments. But he was one of the Stoics of the Middle Store, the transitional period between uh, when the Stoics moved from, from Athens to Rome. And apparently he was a rebel. I mean, he's, he's cited as, you know, disagreeing with, uh, uh, with other Stoics uh, about sort of some important matters uh, and, and certainly in terms of emphasis. Um, but you would expect that within every philosophy, right? So it's like you don't, you don't, I mean, philosophies are not religious uh, prescriptions. They're not, it's not like that just because Epictetus wrote something or Sartre wrote something, then we have to take it as an article of faith. Like, you know, you, you disagree with it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but uh, just go, going back to Epictetus, there was something yes. that I came across that he, he said that I, uh, I really liked, and that was um, he said, um, avoid having sex before marriage, but don't like slut shame people who do. <laughs> that was really right, great. right. But then again, you have um, Marcus Aurelius, um, back to the wine example again, who says, you know, just treat fine wine as if it's um, what moldy grape juice and right. sex is just um, you know friction between private parts with a discharge. That's I right. mean, it's, it's <laughs> this sort of. Thing. I mean, his point was you know don't place too much value on sexual relationships. I understand that. Um, and I know Ryan Holiday in his book um, kind of says, oh, that was a joke. But I know Bill Irvine in his book kind of takes it a bit more seriously and, and emphasizes that sex is destructive and lust is a distraction. Um, but, uh, I mean, I, and I think this is one of the main areas that existentialists would disagree um, because, yes, it's not about being slaves to our desires, but our desire and sexual desire certainly plays a key role in understanding ourselves and it's one way that we try and connect with other people. And, um, I mean, yes, it can be a distraction, but it's also a fundamental and valuable part of existence that we should embrace and celebrate. I mean, some might say that Sartre and de Beauvoir embraced and celebrated it it's like too much, but um, yes. <laughs> no, I'm, not, I'm not making that judgment. But um, yeah, so no, that's, that's the point. So I have to say I tend to agree on. So I have a couple of comments about that that quote from Marcus Aurelius and sort of um, broaden it up a little bit uh, because that's one of the areas. Sex, in particular, is uh, is one of the areas where the Stoics seriously disagreed. I mean, on, on, on really, really big, like probably is the thing that they disagreed the most about among themselves. So, no, I don't think that Ryan Holiday is right when he says that he dismisses that quote by Marcus Aurelius as saying he was joking. First of all, Marcus Aurelius is not known as a, a joking kind of character. He's, he's not, he, his sense of humor was very limited, uh, shall we say. Um, that said, uh, you're right, you, you mentioned yourself that, you know, Mar what Marcus was trying to do there was to warn people, well, warn himself, because remember, he wasn't writing for other people, right? He was writing, uh, writing to himself. This was, the Meditations was his own personal journal, right? And remember that Marcus did have sex a number of times because he had 15 children. So uh, <laughs> it's not like he was a complete stranger to the practice. Um, but I think what he was trying to do was to apply a, a, a uh, stoic technique, which is when you become too fond of something, that is an external, something that is outside of your control, then one good way of doing it, and this is Epictetus does that a lot, a lot, is to uh, bring it back to a factual description of what's going on, right? Uh, because a factual description sort of reminds you that after all, you're getting upset or you're getting worked out, work up about things that are really not that important. So that exercise that, he does, that Marcus does of, sort of describing sex as just a little friction followed by an explosion uh, in a release, um, I think it's meant in that, it's not meant as a joke, but it's also not meant as saying, you know, you should not do it or you should do it only in, in certain very specific circumstances or something like that. It's just, it, it's, a, it's an exercise to remind himself that, Perhaps, I mean, I'm just speculating here, but maybe he wrote that after a battle, you know, an orgy that he had as an emperor on, in the field. And he's like, damn, I shouldn't have done that sort of stuff. So he wrote, he read back and wrote in, in his diary. But the broader point is that, and I wrote an essay, maybe, uh, Dan, we can link to it, um, from the site once the conversation comes out. Uh, I, I wrote about this really fundamental dis difference in which the early Stoics and the late Stoics, mostly the Greek Stoics versus the Roman Stoics, saw sex. It's very consistent. The Roman Stoics, all of them, Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, Musonius Rufus, who was uh, Marcus, uh, sorry, uh, Epictetus' uh, teacher, and Seneca, they all say that you should have sex only 
within a committed relationship, what we would today call it a committed relationship, so marriage basically at the time. Uh, and in fact, several of them say only for procreation. Right, so that's a fairly strict view of sex, and and the reason for that is because it basically it's a passion that distracts you from what is really important in life. Now you go back to the Greek uh, uh, Stoics, particularly Zeno, the founder of Stoicism, and Chrysippus, who was the third head of the Stoa. Completely different story. Uh, you should have sex in the streets with whatever you like, whoever you like, and as, 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 uh, in, in any way you like it. Uh, Zeno wrote in the Republic, which was his description of the ideal Stoic society, that uh, men and women would have open companionships, they could exchange pat partners at will, uh, that men and women would go out uh, dressed in the same way, uh, and then women should be taught philosophy because their their mental faculty are the same as, as, as men. So I think what that reflects is, therefore, my conclusion from that is that there is actually nothing inherent in Stoic philosophy that tells you anything specific about sex. The only thing that really comes out of Stoic philosophy about sex is that it is something that is a preferred indifferent, that you should do it if you, know, if you feel like it and who, with whom you feel like it so long as it doesn't get in the way of practicing virtue. So if you do it in a way that hurts other people, or if you do it in a way that debases other people or something like that, then you shouldn't do it. But other than that, I don't see anything from my understanding of Stoic philosophy that will actually tell you to do it one way or the other. And then the big difference between the, the Greeks and the Roman Stoics is simply because the Roman Stoics uh, lived in a, in a time where there was a lot of prudishness. Uh, a lot of the Roman emperors were, were prudish, uh, beginning with the very first one, Octavian Augustus, was very famous for being you know, very, very strict about uh, customs and about propriety and things like that. Well, on the other hand, the Greeks were very open. It's like, ah, whatever, you know, if, it's, if, it's, if it feels good, let's do it. Um, so, so I think that they, that's a major area where the Stoics themselves just had very, very different, very diverging ideas. And in that sense, surprisingly, the, the existentialists are actually more consistent, I guess on that topic, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah, I also struggle to find um, much on love in, uh, in the Stoic philosophy. Was, I mean, the existentialists have a lot to say about it. Right. Um, that, uh, you know, for Jean-Paul Sartre, um, you know, the, the goal of life is to know ourselves and who would be a better person to help us understand ourselves than a lover um, because we connect right. with them on a much deeper level and at a sensual level um, and which we don't necessarily do with um, other people. Um, and he, he talked about how, you know, with Simone de Beauvoir, he was able to kind of have some kind of communication with her um, without even opening his mouth um, because they'd had intimate relationships. You know, there's some kind of understanding that we can get through other people. Um, so, but, um, I mean, but I know you've written a little bit about love in your uh, new book. Do you want to comment on yeah, that? Yeah, so I think you're right. The, the, the Stoics definitely don't talk much about love. And actually, when they use the word, they, meant, they mean it more broadly, as I was saying earlier, so love of mankind, of humankind in general, not, not just love of specific people. I think that role, of, however, they do recognize the role you're talking about, of a person that helps you to grow and, and helps you to figure out things and so on and so forth, except that that person is not the lover, is the friend. There is a lot of emphasis in uh, Stoicism, and my understanding is not so much actually in existentialism, but you can correct me if I'm wrong, about friendship. Uh, Seneca writes a lot about the importance of a friend. A friend is uh, like Aristotle actually, well, obviously we're not, we're not, it's not a Stoic, but Aristotle said that a friend, a true friend, a real friend, is a mirror to your, a mirror to your soul. Is, is the kind of person that can, has the, the, the ability to tell you if you're doing something wrong and to help you grow. Um, and, and, um, Socrates, I'm uh, sorry, uh, uh, Seneca actually uh, devotes several letters to Lucilius, to his friend Lucilius, about friendship. And there is one in particular where he says, you know, be very careful who you admit into your friendship. And, and, and be very strict about your criteria. But once you do, open completely yourself up to that person. That person now is, is a second self, is somebody that actually you should, you can trust and it can, and, and it can help you grow. So I suspect that, that a reasonable way of looking at it is that, yep, the Stoics did not have a lot of emphasis on love is, uh, in terms of personal relationship, uh, you know, a relationship with another person. Uh, of, of different sex or today, of, obviously, of whatever sex. 
but they did have as sort of as a counterbalance to that. They had a lot of emphasis on on friendship. Uh, what about existentialists? Because I usually read about love, but not as much as about friendship. Is that is that a misunderstanding, or is it or is it reflective of reality? Um, well, they do talk a little bit of. I mean, probably Sartre less so, but I mean Nietzsche was very much um, right. very big in friendship, and he admired you know the Greek ideal of friendship, um, and he talked about how great friends inspire each other. Um, I think he says you know they're a longing. And an arrow towards the overman. So great right. friends inspire each other and challenge each other. And he's like, great friends should um, not be um, sympath- too sympathetic. But you know, to be a great friend, you also have to be an enemy in order to um, challenge the other person. Um, so, and I think Beauvoir picks up on that a little bit too. And she she was um, thought friendship was very important. And in fact, she kind of thought you know a great um, you know love relationship ought to be based on friendship like those were the the best kind because they friends allow one another freedom whereas lovers tend to want to um close each other in and possess one another but she kind of said you know no freedom um sorry um a foundation of say friendship would um uh give each other a lot more um respect right that Um, was one of the reasons i think the stoics were a little bit wary of uh, you know, couple relationships of, between couples because there is that possession, that 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 tendency to want to possess or to control the other person, and of course that would violate the dichotomy of control. Another person is not under your control. Another person's feelings and and behaviors and and decisions are not under your control. And your ha- and if your happiness depends on that, uh, then you're making a mistake, right? And of course you can't really be in a relationship and not wanting the other person to do certain things. You know, you, your happiness does depend to a to a certain degree. Um, now, of course, one could object that the same is true for friendships, that, you know, you also want your friends to like you and so on and so forth. But the Stoics had an interesting take there. Um, first of all, they agreed, they would have agreed with Nietzsche, what you just said about Nietzsche, that is, sometimes your friend is actually your antagonist. It's actually somebody who pushes you, uh, and, and, uh, um, which is a different relationship from a relationship, from a couple relationship. Um, but the other thing that they would say is, in fact, uh, Seneca explicitly says that the, uh, the Stoic sage, that is the ideal, the ideal Stoic, right, um, can do without the assistance of anyone. He can, you know, if if um, uh, he is is sufficient unto himself or herself, uh, but doesn't prefer to be that way. And the reason they say that is because, of course, they lived in a in a in a time where you could easily lose a friend to exile or to death. You know, sudden death. I mean, we we keep forgetting that um, you know the emperor Marcus Aurelius, who I said had fourteen or fifteen children, but he lost many of them, most of them, uh, before they reached adulthood. Right? The only only four daughters, I think, and one son uh, survived. And this is this is the emperor. This is the guy that has you know the best life possible, the access to the best medicine, and so on and so forth. So you can imagine for most other people, so the mortality rate was very high. And when you live in that kind of environment, it's not surprising that you tend to develop a philosophy of self-sufficiency. Um, but even within that philosophy of self-sufficiency, uh, the Stoics were very clear that your life is certainly going to be enriched by a good friend, by, by the existence of good human relations, that, that you shouldn't shy away so long as you keep considering them uh, uh, sort of uh, something that is... Uh, independent from the pursuit of virtue, that you that you should be able to pursue virtue, to have a meaningful life, regardless of anything that happens to you. Um, uh, you were saying earlier something about uh, some of the existentialists that we saying that regardless of circumstances, you should be able to sort of uh, to find meaning in 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 life. Well, uh, there's the famous image there is the the sage on the rack. The idea is that, that even on the rack, the sage is happy. Not happy in the sense that he prefers to be on the rack. Nobody prefers to be tortured. But in the sense that he can still maintain his moral integrity, which makes his life or his death, as it turns out, um, uh, you know, um, uh, something worth worthwhile. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. I, I have a oh. second topic, another topic, but go ahead. Okay. Well, just um, further to that, um, I guess Simone de Beauvoir would have, 
um, problem with, with, I mean, Sartre might agree, but Simone de Beauvoir was particularly attuned to, say, women's oppression. Um, and I know Epictetus says that, keep in mind, it isn't the one who has it in for you and takes a swipe that harms you, but rather the harm comes from your own belief about the abuse. Um, so I think that works when we're um, talking about, you know, not um, like just people being mean to one another or something, but when you're talking about systematic oppression, I mean, that can potentially be used as an excuse for victim blaming. Like it's, um, and it can potentially be used as an excuse to justify, you know, abuse and oppression. Um, so, and Beauvoir would say, well, no, all oppression creates a state of war and we can't really live if we're in chains. We can't really live unless we have an open future in which we can be agents in our own lives. And, um, if there are injustices in the, injustices in the world, then we shouldn't, you know, go quietly about our lives. You know, it's about rebellion and in, uh, engagement in life. You know, don't, don't keep calm and carry on. But, I mean, her point was also that it's not something that we, uh, that people as individuals can overcome, that kind of systematic oppression. But that's why she argued that we need to, um, you know, form solidarities to um, challenge, uh, say, well, she was talking in the second sex about women's oppression specifically. Um, Can I add one thing on that just to Massimo so to, yeah. to really give Massimo a hard a challenge? Um, sure. Um, oh, you mean that wasn't hard enough? Yeah, okay. well, I just want to I, I want to add to women's oppression. I want to add uh, uh, genocide on top of it. Um, ah, sure. You, you know, one of the, one of, the big. Why not? <laughs> one of the strongest elements of Primo Levi's survival in Auschwitz uh, is precisely that um, the victims are not no, are, are not noble either. Um, in other words, um, the, one of the ideas, I mean, one of the things he chronicles is the way that the, that the Jews treated each other in the camps, right. which was pretty abominably. I mean, they stole from each other and they clawed at each other and they, um, um, and the idea is sort of that, you know, um, you can treat people in such a way that you rob them of their humanity and then they will act like animals and they will become animals. Uh, and that's what's, in a sense, so tragic about about this sort of treatment of people. And so I guess I, I do think that there is something deeply artificial about the Stoic attitude. And that is, uh, trust me, I can take away your humanity to the point where I've taken away your virtue too. Because you will be reduced to an animal uh, when I do it. What is the response to that? And I think Sky's point makes a similar point, maybe in less dramatic terms. Oh, I mean, that, that, those are excellent questions, and, and they, they are difficult. I do think that there are answers there, uh, but um, let, me, let me go about it um, in, in a couple of different ways. So the, the standard Stoic answer there is look at what the Stoics were doing, uh, and you will get an idea that they were actually definitely not in the thralls of circumstances. They wouldn't say, oh, well, you know, this is the way it is. I'm just going to lay down and take it. Uh, you know, Epictetus was a slave that, 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 that was eventually freed and turned uh, uh, teacher, and he was clearly trying to make a difference uh, for his students. Marcus Aurelius was an emperor. He was constantly trying to do the right thing, of course, as he saw it from a point of, you know, from a Roman point of view. But it is interesting, for instance, that he declined to persecute the Christians, uh, which were already a quote unquote nuisance at that point in the Roman Empire. Uh, he only fought defensive wars. He didn't expand. He didn't try to expand the the the, uh, the empire because he tried to do he very consciously tried to do so the right thing at a societal level at a at a, at a big level. Um, uh, Zeno, as I said mentioned earlier, actually wrote an entire book about how we should change society and make it more equal. Make it make uh, you know there were there there were no slaves and no disparity between men and women in Zeno's uh, sort of stoic society. So there is that. Uh, one of the typical stoic responses to, to, to that kind of uh, criticism is that, you know, let's not forget that one of the four fundamental virtues is justice. And, uh, and so it is, a, it is, in fact, crucial. It's embedded in the stoic philosophy that you should uh, work for a better world. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, cosmopolitanism is, is, was a big picture, big part of the, of the stoic picture, and uh, so that all of humanity should be treated, uh, you know, with fairness and, and with justice. So I think that all of those actually are responses that, to some extent, blunt that kind of criticism. But I think, um, I certainly, and, and by the way, uh, uh, Dan, uh, specifically for your example of, you know, what happened during the, the, during the Holocaust, you mentioned Primo Levi, who is one of my favorite uh, writers. 
But also Viktor Frankl, who we mentioned earlier, was a survival of the Holocaust, and he got out of it. He, he actually uh, uh, credits sort of the stoic approach, essentially, to, to, to be able to getting out of it and to be uh, coming out of it as a better person, as a, as a more um, you know, developed person, both morally and, and otherwise. Um, but I take the point that, especially, you know, the way in which uh, Sky was saying it, that yes, if you just read Epictetus, certain passages in Epictetus, it does sound like you should, uh, you know, just lay down and take it because that's, uh, that's the way it is, right? And in that sense, it's very similar to the Christian, you know, offer the other cheek. It's like, well, you know, you should, you should forgive, uh, rather than, than react. But I do think that Epictetus there means it very specifically within the context of the dichotomy of control. That is, when he was a slave, you know, there's this famous story that he, when he was a slave, he had two masters. The second master is the one that brought him uh, later in life into um, to the court of Nero, uh, and then eventually freed him. And he was a good a good master, so to speak, right? Some, somebody who treated his, his slaves uh, well. But the first master was not. He was the son of a bitch, apparently. And uh, uh, allegedly, he's the one that broke uh, Epictetus' leg, and he was lame for life as a result, right? And so the story there, the Lord, we, we don't know whether, whether this happened or not, but it, but it does make a point. The story is that the master was beating uh, Epictetus and particularly insisting on, on, on uh, putting pressure on the leg. And then Epictetus looked at it and he said, you know, if you keep going, the leg will break. And sure enough, the, lo- the leg did break and Epictetus looked at it and said, I told you so. And this is often taken as an, as an example of sort of extreme resilience to the circumstances, right? Um, but I think what he meant by that is like it was not under his control. It's not that he could, even if you ob- object to, obviously, as you should, <laughs> slavery as an institution, if you are a slave and you are in chain and the other person has complete control over what happens to you physically, there's not much sense in doing anything other than, uh, you know, looking at how you uh, you you um, take the circumstance. You uh, you approach the circumstance. In that case, Epictetus, what what Epictetus did was to take it with a somewhat a sense, you know, a, a very dry sense of humor, right? Right, uh, telling his master, "Well, I told you so. I told you you were bro- breaking my leg, even though it was in fact a painful thing that was happening to him." So I take the point. Yes, one needs to be careful because if one takes some of the Stoics sayings too literally, then they can definitely lead to passivity, in, especially in terms of sort of systematic oppression uh, like the one that Sky was talking about. But I think there has actually a number of resources, both in Stoic philosophy and, and in terms of examples of actual Stoics living their life in a, in a certain way, uh, to say that that is definitely, you know, it's not a component of the philosophy. Uh, you, can, you can take it either way. You can say... Well, I don't have any control of the circumstances, so uh, it's all it's all up to my uh, attitude in this particular case. But uh, that doesn't mean you don't have a broader view of where things should go and 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 that things are not just or not the way should they should be, and so they should be changed. Let me just follow up one last thing, Massimo, um, yeah. and this does apply to both the existentialist and the uh, or at least one version of it, and so Skyway and also, I wasn't so much pushing on the idea of moral passivity mm-hmm. i was pushing on the idea of self-sufficiency of of of, of flourishing ah, and yeah. my the point i thought that one of the points that comes out of levy is someone else can take your humanity away from you and reduce you to an animal now it's okay. very nice that epictetus reacted to his leg being broken in this way but i have a different time difficult time and maybe this is what sky meant by victim blaming i have a difficult time saying about a person who is in a concentration camp who has been so reduced to animality that they find themselves stealing from someone else's children so that their children won't starve. I have difficulty saying that they have failed in some way. And it seems to me that the Stoic has to say something like that. And that's what I'm objecting to. I'm objecting to the idea of the utter self-sufficiency of flourishing is what I'm objecting to using this example. Yeah. um, No, that's a good, that's, that's a good point. Um, So, the Stoics do have a way out of that particular problem, which is none of us is a sage. The only person that would not lose his humanity 
under extreme circumstances is the sage, is the perfect stoic, is the is the is the enlightened is what the Buddhists would call the enlightened person, right? I mean, Buddhism has a similar situation, by the way, and he, and Buddhism is actually blamed for 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 similarly for you know teaching about non-attachment and teaching about the you know the, the, the distancing oneself from circumstances. Um, but only the enlightened person, and in the case of Buddhism, and only the sage in the case of Stoicism, can actually really do that. Everybody else can strive, however, uh, in that direction. And I, I would turn it around on you in, in some sense, Dan, uh, if you don't mind, and say that, right, every actual human being at some point can be broken. Uh, you know, there's, there's, it's hard to imagine... Uh, that there are circumstances, or human beings that under those circumstances will not break. Um, but if you practice uh, stoicism, if you really internalize the dichotomy of control, if you really internalize the importance of virtues, I think that the idea is that that will actually push that point, that breaking point, as far as it is humanly possible. That is, you will actually maintain a lot of your integrity, a lot of your humanity under very difficult circumstances. But no, that's right. Nobody can maintain it under, regardless of the circumstances. Uh, you know, we're, we're all human. Uh, the, the Romans had a saying about this. So one of, one of the, uh, stoic role models was Cato the Younger, right? And Cato the Younger was an arch enemy of Julius Caesar. By the way, he was an example of somebody trying to change society, right? He was, he actually started a revolution, uh, to stop what, uh, what he considered as Julius Caesar's tyranny, right? Um, now, eventually, he, he lost, uh, and, and you know, he committed suicide. He took the open door, uh, as Epictetus would say. But for mo- for all of his life, he's, he was known as a person with, of utmost integrity. Okay, but the, under very difficult circumstances, maintaining integrity, he was an exemplar to everybody else. And the Rome, in fact, he was so much an exemplar that the Romans developed this saying that was like, "Well, not everybody can be a Cato." Or, you know, well, I'm not a Cato, meaning it's, it's, the standard was put so high, the bar was so high that most actual people, most real people would, would fail it. But that is why Cato was admired, because even though he himself was fallible, and we know from his biography that he actually did uh, fall short of sort of the, the sage in a number of circumstances, he very consciously tried to maintain his integrity and his humanity uh, under very difficult circumstances. And I think that is actually an, 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 a good thing to do. I mean, it's a good thing to, to, to strive toward, granting the fact that we are all human beings and therefore at some point we all fall. Sky, did you want to weigh in on that at all? Um, yeah, I guess just to say that, um, I mean, this is uh, certainly Samantha Bhavar and Jamal Sartre acknowledge, you know, these facts of our existence. Um, and, you know, they used to argue about it. Um, for example, a harem girl. Um, Sartre said, well, that kind of existence could be lived in several different ways. But Bhavar's point was that, well, n- no, that's not the point. She doesn't have any practical freedom. And therefore, her existence is basically, like, annihilated. You know, she's reduced to a thing um, because she can't um, create her own f- future. She doesn't have um, the freedom to choose and so Beauvoir's point was that you know we need to rebel against that and that's why you know existentialism is often associated with um, rebellion and revolt and working together to change the conditions of our lives and we have a moral responsibility to be engaged in creating the conditions Um, but you know and Simone de Beauvoir also acknowledged that there is often a cost to that Um, so we need to decide well at what cost um, do we want to um, stand up and rebel? And but she acknowledged that you know the, um, the masses can be very, or the tyranny of the masses is um, certainly a problem. Yeah, the, the flip side of that coin um, of sort of uh, the, the, the discussion where you were describing between Sartre and the uh, is is that there is a flip side to that coin, right? So on the one hand, you want to say, yeah, you don't want to accept the status quo. If the status quo in, in, implies the, obs- the, the, the um, oppression of people, women, or, or imagine you know lots of people that have lived and live still today uh, under dictatorships or tyrannies or something like that, right? But the flip side of that coin uh, is that if you say that only people who rebel are actually free and authentic and all that sort of stuff, that robs 
of meaning, the life of millions and millions and millions of people that have, that, that have lived under certain, those circumstances. And so what the Stoic would say is like, well, the big picture is, yes, we want a, a better society. We want to, you know, a society of cosmopolitan society of, of justice and fairness for everybody. But at the same time, there are, for instance, people that lived their entire life under the Soviet Union or under East, in East Germany, and they've managed to find a way to uh, have meaning in their life anyway, even though they were under very difficult circumstances, right? And in fact, one of the things that gives you meaning to your life is precisely how you get through those circumstances, right? How do you, do you lose your humanity? Do you become an animal? Do you become a beast? Or do you still maintain a certain integrity and in, in trying to do your best of, to ameliorate the situation given the, the, the big picture? You cannot change the big picture, but you can definitely make a difference individually for other people that are around you. So, so there is a, there's a trade-off, I think, there between those two uh, positions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's a, you know, there's a big question about, um, you know, you talk about, was it the um, uncontrollable externals? Like, mm -hmm. cho like choosing where you draw that line between right. what you want to rebel against and what you're going to decide is, you know, outside your control. And I, I find that line very blurry. Yeah, that's right. Uh, that the, the Stoics would say that that is uh, one of the four virtues: practical wisdom. Practical wisdom tells you, you know, where you draw, you should draw the line. And and yes, there is no universal answer. The, the one of the nice things about virtue ethics, I think, is precisely it doesn't give you a specific answer about specific situations because every situation is different, and and it's up to you to figure out uh, where it is that you that it's reasonable to draw the line in that specific case. Massimo, do you think it's um? Just to close out that last point, I, I really like the answer you gave to my, my challenge. And maybe this is a, a consequence of maybe reading ancient philosophy too, with too modern an eye in the sense that um, they are intended to be lived philosophies. And so we shouldn't interpret the claim of the self-sufficiency of virtue in too pure a way, right? It's an idealization. Right. Um, um, right. But no lived person ever is going to accomplish that ideal. In that sense, it's like a platonic form, right? Yeah, in that sense, it is, it is an ideal. That's right. I mean, let's not forget that the, the, the Stoics uh, were big into role models, right? They, they said that you should pattern. The way you learn virtue is by picking, on, picking people that you want to emulate, whose behavior you want to emulate, right? Um, and some of those people can be your friends. Some can be famous people that you happen to know about, you know, Cato again being the obvious example. But some of them were fictional, right? Yeah. So Odysseus was a, a stoic role model, for instance. I'm reading a wonderful book about uh, how different philosophies have changed, um, have, have adopted uh, different aspects of, of the Odysseus um, legend uh, to their own, for their own purposes. It turns out that the, the Platonists had one take on Odysseus and the Stoics had another one and the Cynics had another one and so on and so forth. Each one saw a, a different thing. Um, what is the point of using a, a, a fictional character as a role model? Well, the point is that precisely it's because it's fictional, it's an ideal, right? And you know that you're not going to be Odysseus because there is no such a thing as Odysseus. It never existed, right? Um, but at the same time, that role model can embody what you are striving for, and it can serve as a as a as a reference point, as a as a almost as if you were navigating with a star. You know, you'd never reach the star, uh, but you're using the star to navigate uh, the best as you as you can. Is there a similar Is, role, Sky, in existentialism for role models yeah. or for using fiction? I mean, certainly all the. Many of the well-known existentialists wrote fiction. Um, That's right. <laughs> is there a similar uh, a notion that that there is to be found in fiction or arts kind of useful idealizations? Um, look, I'm struggling to find that. I mean, there are lots of examples um, that they use in fiction, certainly. Um, and the the gaze of the other, I think, is a really important um, you know play plays that role in a way. For example, Sartre talks about explain um, that. Yeah, he talks about um, like in being a nothingness, looking through a keyhole, you're spying on someone. And if you're alone, um, you don't judge yourself. You're not reflecting on yourself. Um, but as soon as you hear a noise behind you, you, know, you kind of panic and think, oh, my goodness, who who's watching me? Am I doing something wrong? Um, and but the, 
what matters here is your relationship to that person who's just found you. Do you care about that person? Do you know them? If, if you have nothing to do with that person, then maybe you'll just go on looking through the keyhole. But if it's someone that you really admire and that you care about or you're in love with, then that makes a difference because you're, you're suddenly thinking, well, how are they judging me? Um, and how does my, how do my actions, um, play out in, in terms of that relationship? Um, so it's like that gaze of the other that's always peering down on us that I think plays a, a bigger role than, um, say, an idealized um, person. Well, that's interesting, Aurora, because uh, so Seneca says something very similar. He says you, you should always go around as if some of your close friends were watching over you mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, and, and ask yourself, well, is it something that my friends or something that my role model or whatever would approve? Of. And of course, in modern sense, this is what we call a conscience, right? Uh, it's like you you, are, you have this idealized version even of yourself, right? You know, that, that, that you are aspiring to be, and then when you do not feel like you you've got to that to that level, then you feel bad. You say, "Oh, damn! I should have I should have done better because you know I failed myself." And I mean, we do use that phrase, you know, "I failed myself," um, and. Um, so externalizing this thing, like like saying, imagining that there's somebody looking over you, I think actually is psychologically very useful. In fact, there is very good evidence that when people, um, uh, you know, psychological evidence from psycho psychological research, that when people are told that uh, there is a God that is looking over them, they actually tend to behave be better because they're conscious of the fact that, whether regardless or not of whether their specific religion is or whatever it is, but when they're reminded of that, they actually tend to behave more ethically because there's, you know, somebody's watching over it, and, and um, it, it's an interesting idea. So, do we have time for one more topic? It's uh, an uh, well, uh, you tell me. It's an, we're at an hour and twenty five minutes. Um, oh, it is ten wow. minutes to seven Eastern. So, you <laughs> tell me whether you guys uh, want to go and do anything else, or whether you want to uh, leave it uh, to a future discussion. Can I just, I, I, can I make a final point? Yes. Um, just that there was something else I came across. Um, when Epictetus says, first tell yourself what kind of person you want to be, then do what you have to do. And right. I think that's very similar to existential authenticity. In terms of, you know, they say existence precedes essence, so we exist first and then right. create ourselves as the kind of person we want to be. And we are creative people. Um, so I, I just thought that was a really interesting. Yeah, I think that's a good way to end it, I, I guess, because this is, this is a good level of agreement um, uh, be between the two. Yes, that's right. You have to be, I mean, the Stoics, just like the, the existentialists, were very much into taking responsibility for what you're doing. Uh, probably they were a different, you know, I understand that, for instance, uh, a lot of the existentialists, especially Sartre, rejected the idea of determinism, for instance, while the, uh, the Stoics were definitely determinists. You know, philosophically speaking, they were uh, compatibilists in terms of free will. They, they, were, they accepted that there is a universal causality, you know, uh, cause and effect uh, in an action of which human beings are, are part. But nonetheless, you're still responsible for your own choices because your internal choices are part of the causal web of, of the universe. And so in that sense, uh, I think there's good level of similarity. There is, yeah, you, you, you are who you are, what ki the kind of actions you, the, the person you are shows through uh, by the kind of actions you make, by the kind of judgments you make, by the kind of things you actually do or try to do if, if you fail. Yeah. So I guess that's a good way to end then, I guess. Okay, well, um, for people in the audience who want to learn more about these philosophies as lived, um, as uh, philosophies of living, uh, check out uh, Sky's Existentialism and Romantic Love and Massimo's soon to come out, How to Be a Stoic. And um, I look forward to talking with you both again. Yeah, it was a pleasure. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dan. All thank right. you, Massimo. Take thank care. You.